Canada's highest mountain is there, and one of the great ice fields of the world. There's a glacier 70 miles long with ice that has remained solid for 500,000 years. On the highest crags, mountain goats pose against the skyline, and in the valleys, there are moose, caribou, and grizzly bear. We're going there now, up to where the Yukon borders Alaska, to Klawani in the wild country. You could walk in here if you had the legs for it, but it wouldn't be easy. As yet, there are no trails leading through Canada's superb new national park and wildlife refuge. This is Cloane, 8,500 square miles of it, including the St. Elias mountain range with eight peaks over 15,000 feet. This is the country of the Nunatak, islands of rocks in seas of ice. If you're going deep into the wilderness, as John and Janet Foster did as wildlife photographers, best make the first part of the journey with an experienced mountain pilot who will remember on what gravel bar he left you. Part of the Yukon Territory, itself an area twice the size of Great Britain, larger than California and Pennsylvania combined. When you go into this country, travel light, as light as they do, for everything you take in will end up on your back. Camera gear, dried foods, sleeping bags, climbing boots, even the tent that will become your base camp when you set out for the feeding grounds of the fabulous doll sheep. Yukon weather at 6,000 feet is totally unpredictable. You need lightweight clothing in layers that can be added to or taken off. And of course, a strong pair of waterproof leather boots. As photographers, we like our wilderness wild and really enjoy working for those photographs. At the end of all the effort, there's the satisfaction of knowing that you and that camera are really in wild country. Kluwani is the world's last safe refuge for dull sheep. They've been protected here since the early 40s. It's unmistakably their kind of country. One moment they're below you, and then suddenly they're up there looking down on you.
The doll sheep, for some reason, are very, very spooky, very nervous, they're very tense. We took a long time sneaking up on them. In fact, we spent most of one whole day. We were crouched down behind a very high rock and we could see them. There was about 14 of them across from us and we were finally able to get up to them. Not all that close, but, uh, but near enough so that with a long camera lens, you can get some pretty good pictures of them. Shooting with a camera requires far more work and perseverance than shooting with a rifle. You have all the excitement of the hunt, but at the end of it all, the animal stays free and wild. The willow ptarmigan finds some measure of safety through natural camouflage, blending into the rocks and lichens of the tundra. You expect a grandeur and a certain harsh beauty in these mountains. But you may not be prepared for this brilliance of the alpine meadow. In the alpine meadow, you have every conceivable variety of little flower and they're all mixed in together. So within, say, a single square yard, you can have maybe nine or ten different kinds of flowers. You have forget-me-nots beside little tiny violets or little tiny daisies, and they're all growing in an absolute profusion of color, and they're all sizes. And there comes a moment when you finally glimpse the one creature that fears no one. And you hope that the grizzly isn't a female, and that you haven't somehow positioned yourself between the lady and her cubs. Above all, you don't run. A grizzly can outrun any man. Looking north from this plateau, you can see the grazing lands of a more gentle species of wildlife, just outside the boundaries of Kluane National Park. Some biologists believe they are true mountain caribou. knows very much about them, the thought to be a subspecies. And since they don't migrate hundreds of miles like other caribou, this land they live on is really critical to their survival. Flies and mosquitoes bother them, they move up onto higher ground and escape for a few hours on snow that's left over from a long Yukon winter. The Continental Divide passes through here, 
From above these gentle valleys, you can look southwest a hundred miles to the Pacific Ocean. And down the other slope, the lake that gives the park its name, Kluwani, the largest lake in the Yukon and one of the stormiest. And along the shore of this emerald lake runs one of the fabled roads of modern history. Built during the Second World War to carry supplies to Fairbanks, it's still unpaved and still the main gateway through Canada to the far northwest. Mile 1070 on the Alaska Highway. All summer long, the trailers and camper trucks move on through with headlights probing the dust and the flying stones. And every once in a while, you'll meet someone a little more adventuresome, someone who really tastes that dust. In the gentle lowlands at the south end of the park, you'll find the Kathleen Lakes. Glistening waters as free of man-made pollution as any in North America, or possibly the world. This part of the country is closer to the highway, accessible by boat and canoe. And if any fisherman ever left here without a catch, well, there's no living memory of it and certainly no official record. The waters here are rich in northern pike, landlocked salmon, lake trout, and that beautifully marked specimen, the Arctic grayling. And even this close to the road, maybe an hour's paddle away, the most inexperienced tourist can have his own private wilderness adventure. Overhead, the branches are filled with small birds of the forest, including the gaily singing fox sparrow. For those who want to extend their stay in Kluwani, there are organized tent and trailer sites. Room right now for several hundred campers. But by the 1980s, the park planners anticipate that 300,000 people a year will pass through here. Not all of them bound for the high peaks. Indeed, many of them will be content to remain near their lowland camps. And there they will meet some of the smallest and tamest of the Yukon creatures, including 
the ubiquitous ground squirrel. I know people think, well, they're kind of a nuisance and they're just a little old rodent, but they really are kind of fun and they seem to have a real personality to them. And they sit up and they look at you and they seem to say, hello, how are you? And, uh, and they're really rather delightful little things. The squirrel himself may find things less amusing. His main role in life being to provide a protein diet for eagles, wolves, foxes, hawks, owls, and even the lordly grizzly. But it's the trackless interior of Kluwani that planners are now exploring. They're looking for hiking trails, canoe routes, and they themselves are a new breed of public servant. Young, college trained, dedicated to the healing concept of wilderness. Park planners like Jerry Lee and Chris George spend weeks in the backcountry, away from their desks. They have to walk, fly, climb and paddle through every corner of a new park. The massive glaciers in this park feed some wild and dangerous rivers. And someone has to find out just how wild and how dangerous. That, my friends, is how it's done by the experts in a situation of very high risk. In the upper reaches of the Alsec, not only are the currents treacherous, but the water is an icy 34 degrees and full of silt and barely submerged rocks. A mountain river with a high and a low tide, rising in the ice fields high above, it reaches maximum flow in the melting sun of late afternoon and then recedes again in the cool of twilight. The headwaters run through one of the Yukon's grander valleys, the Shakwak. Then the river broadens into a shallow glacial lake, wandering past enormous walls of solid ice. This actually is the toe of the lower glacier, and beyond are the lower reaches of the Kaskawalsh, the Steel, the Donjak, and many other glaciers, the greatest concentration of ice on Earth outside the polar regions. At moments impossible to predict, the glaciers are prone to give off icebergs, towering masses of ice 
that topple into the water, setting up shock waves 30 feet high. From this point, the ALSEC plunges on toward the Pacific, but the park planners followed it no farther. In their final report, they made the laconic observation, not recommended as a waterway for the general public, but possibly a white water challenge for the world's best canoeists. Not all the rivers of the Yukon are as formidable as the Alsek. For John and Janet Foster, the Sakai River in the lowlands of Kluane was manageable for most of its length and rewarding for all of it. The Sakai River is fast, but it's not deep or dangerous. You can drift down riding the current, but the trip upstream, knee deep in icy water, is a little different. This is superb wilderness, a typical piece of the Yukon. Moose and wolves and grizzlies walk these shores. I've always loved the beach because it's the uh, easiest way to really see who your neighbors are. Because you look on the beach and you see, uh, you see if you have wolves or if you have grizzlies, and uh, you can see these things on the beach. And, uh, and they really tell a story. You can see where all the wolf tracks are. And then, of course, the moment that we put our footprints onto it, in a way, we're going into the story as well. And uh, there's really something rather thrilling about that. The lesser yellow legs pays so little attention to the occasional human that you feel slightly ridiculous peering at him through a 400 millimeter lens. However, there's another bird on these beaches with a totally different opinion about visitors. The Arctic Turn is one bird that will really defend very fiercely its own nest and its young as their territory. In fact, I was carrying a very small stick, really to, really to protect my own head, because uh, I was the intruder. And uh, the Arctic Tern was simply saying that it was his beach and I didn't belong. Well, it was their beach and I was the intruder and they were dive bombing me. But it was their way of saying, if you don't mind, this is our beach, and we have a young here. And this is our home, so we'd like you to leave, please. And you understand this, and you say, OK. Ten o'clock at night, and still the daylight lingers. These are the perfect moments, a time to sit and stare into the campfire and to look back on a full day.
We don't really fish for sport anymore, just for food. In fact, we're finding out that we've almost stopped fishing. As you spend more and more time photographing wildlife, it really becomes harder and harder to kill anything. Beavers usually wait for darkness, but the midsummer nights are so short up here that they move around in broad daylight. And that most magnificent bird, rare everywhere except in the Northwest, the bald eagle. anxious about intruders near its nest. Both of the eagles were extremely upset and they were calling and screaming the whole time. In fact, they were rather like a couple of brand new parents with uh, a single first little child. And they screamed around us and screamed and screamed as if they were saying, go away, go away. And uh, a little one was up there, and he was he was sitting on his branch, very solidly facing forward, and uh, he he didn't seem to be phased at all by our presence. And when you find yourself in the country of the northern moose, enter quietly with soft paddles. Moose are beautifully adapted to their environment. They move quite easily through forests and swamps. We've seen them completely underwater in a current that would sweep a man off his feet. But a cow moose with her cat can be extremely dangerous. And you have to be really careful when you're canoeing in shallow water. See those ears going back? She's not missing anything. Her front feet are her defense, and she strikes with terrific force. Even with mother to protect him, he may still fall to a timber wolf. All creatures are left alone here, and all the natural laws of survival must apply. It's silent country, made for silent travel. A wilderness photographer could spend a lifetime here. Canadian bush pilots flew through the turbulence of these passes, watching at every moment for a possible landing field. Now it's a lot simpler. For these new birds can set you down like an eagle, or pick you off a mountain ledge at almost any altitude. Their destination now is the upper reaches of the St. Elias Range, right up at the edge of oxygen country where the only animal foolhardy enough to risk crevasse and avalanche is man himself. Bob Dunbar learned to fly the hard way in combat. His helicopter was shot down four times in 12 months and picked up 74 bullet holes including a few in his own skin. 
Now he's a Yukon mountain pilot and knows the wildlife here in Kluwani as well as anyone. Actually, the major hazard up here is weather. Each mountain makes its own system. Micro weather, they call it. Blizzard conditions in one valley, spring breezes in the next, and a torment of swirling air in between. In a few moments, Bob will go back down the mountain. But first, he takes a silent inventory. Down at base, he checked out their equipment. No one gets up here without survival gear. The big sheep we saw on the way in on the moon? Yeah, sheep and goats both over there. Yeah. And there's grizzly bears around here. You can see where one dug out a ground squirrel. Is that why you set it down here? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Are they going to give us any trouble? No, I don't think so. Uh, just be careful with your food. And if you go walking in the brush country, uh, make lots of noise and you'll scare them off. I have a whistle. Should I wear it? Sure, wear that. And if uh, they come around up here, blow it, and they'll probably run off. <laughs> OK. OK. We'll see you in a couple of days there, bud. All right. Thanks Thanks so have a good time. Bye. Right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. high now. The doll sheep are somewhere below now. This high country belongs to the greatest climbers of them all. They have little fear of visitors among these jagged rocks, for at this altitude the mountain goat can outnimble anything can stand with four legs bunched on a pointed crag and run with ease along a seemingly perpendicular rock face. They're seldom bothered by predators. Nothing else on four legs can cope up here. But golden eagles sometimes prey on the very young. them. Cold doesn't. Their white fur growing to a thickness of four inches. Fair enough, for on a January day the temperature here can drop to 80 below. Then, out onto the face of the great Kaskawalsh Glacier. In future years, 
there'll be a hiking trail close to the edge of this river of ice. But the glacier itself will be traveled only by experienced mountaineers and glaciologists. Here, the ice beneath your feet could be some 2,500 feet thick. And there's one thing certain. It's imperceptibly on the move. We've never walked on a glacier before. It's a strange and beautiful experience. It's also a little dangerous. The Casco Welsh is deeply crevassed and split where millions of tons of ancient ice have ground over a ridge or turned across the foot of a mountain. Somewhere in all this whiteness is the veteran mountaineer who presides over these vast spaces, who shares the decisions as to who may and who may not venture into the shadow of Mount Logan. His name is Monty Alford, and he has led or been part of every major climbing expedition here in the past 20 years, including the Robert Kennedy ascent of what is now Mount Kennedy. He's climbed in Europe, in South America, in the Rockies, but he says these St. Elias Mountains are the best. How do you get out of a crevasse, Marty? Well, to begin with, you're tied to the rope uh, as you're traversing the glacier so that you have uh, not only your tie to the rope, but also two slings are tied to the same rope just ahead of the body, mm -hmm. uh, ready for a crevasse fall should you accidentally go in. The idea, of course, is to keep out of crevasses. Yeah. So if you fall down a crevasse, why can't your other two people on the rope just pull you straight up? Yes, in, in some cases they can, but, but uh, invariably they are on their anchors. They're, they have put their ice axes down and they're laying on them. And, just uh, to hold you. Just to hold you. Yeah. Now, until they can get in a position of transferring it from their anchor, transferring their anchor to a more permanent one, and be free to come and assist you. You're on your own. You're on your own, yes. Sure, sir. He's done this many times with a 60-pound pack on his back. It's called prussicking. Loops around each foot are attached to the main rope by sliding knots. And then as you push the knot upwards, your foot comes up with it. Are you all set? Yeah. I think so. How does that feel? Seems to be all right. Now, well, this should go off. Take this one up as far as you can, yeah, so that you relax my leg a take your weight on it right. Now, another place? Very good. Very good. Take it up as far as you can. This one here? Yes. Okay. Good. Now put some weight on it. Put some weight just on the leg. Yeah. On keep, this leg? Yes. Keep this one dead straight now. Bring it away from the uh, wall. Bring it away from the wall? Yes. Don't be afraid. That's right. Till you're actually standing on it. Right. Oh, yeah, then, that's it. Yeah, there you are. Good. Wait a minute now. Don't have this hand on top of this rope, but underneath it. Right. All right? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Now, while you're standing on that one, raise the other one. Very good. Yeah. Put your foot in it. Right. Raise the other leg. That's the idea. Excellent. Oh, I see. Excellent. <laughs> I think I've got it. <laughs> I think she's got it. Good <laughs> <laughs> job. 
straight in the leg, right? Yeah. Look at that. Very good. Yeah, the knots are holding real good. Yeah. Yeah. Am I going right? Egg. Nope. Next time we're going to find you a deeper crevasse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to be able to get away from the rope a bit so I can move it up. Can I, any way of getting out? Yes, you can use your crampons. Yeah. Just take the right. Oh, yes! <laughs> Whoops. Let's do it. Just keep your points into the wall. That's it. I'm here! <laughs> Congratulations. I made it. But you're not quite there. Yeah, I know. What? I've got more to go. You just balance on your knees. Yeah. And there, in all its majesty, is the roof of Canada. In a small aircraft, it takes more than an hour to circle the huge mass of rock that is Mount Logan. At its base, it's a hundred miles around, and its loftiest peak reaches 19,850 feet. CJQ 755 calling 756, do you copy? If you wanted to land at 10,000 feet up in those mountains, you'd go to the Arctic Institute base camp on Trelawney Lake and ask for Phil Upton. He's the Yukon's number one mountain pilot. Yeah, Roger, Roger. Uh, our plans here, uh, starting tomorrow morning, I'm going into Whitehorse to pick uh, up Fred Armstrong and bring him out here for a couple of days. And when I get back, I'll put on the skis and we'll be all set to come up there. We have a group of people who would like to come up and uh, visit the camp and have a look at it and look at the buildings that you're testing, etc. Yeah, roger, roger on that. This is CJQ 755, clear with 756, see you at 0900, over. The aircraft belongs to the Arctic Institute of North America. Its function is to carry scientists, mountaineers, and occasional visiting photographers like John and Janet to the upper levels of the ice field ranges, to places like the 10,000-foot-high Eclipse Camp and others even higher. At Eclipse Camp, Phil roars in on an uphill slope. Oh. I bet it's a fake. <laughs> Kluwani is a land of incredible contrasts. You can be fishing in the lowlands on a summer morning, and two hours later find yourself right back into winter at 9,800 feet. This is a world of science up here. There are mountaineers, geologists, even an army doctor measuring the effects of exertion in this thin mountain air. They're also up here because they love mountains with a reverence that's hard to express. Look at that. That's Brenda. She's a high altitude raven. <laughs> Real food is not even half dried. Did you catch that? Out of Kluwani or? No, these, these are the stuff I like. Oh. oh. Yeah, After three weeks of freeze-dried food, fresh fish, How often will you see a symbolic wedding, 
silently witnessed by the greatest mountain peaks in Canada, with the bridal gown made from the parachute that dropped in supplies, and the bride given away by a veteran climber. A love for and a drive to nature. For Joe and Susie, who met on a volcano in Mexico, it was a way of expressing their reverence for wilderness and mountains. A farewell to Eclipse Camp before their real wedding among family and friends. It was a moment that deeply affected all who were present. Their ceremony spoke of mountains and mystery. The feeling of communion among people that comes in a setting such as this. In their words, in the mountains and in each other, we find inner strength, freedom, beauty, serenity and happiness. These steadfast peaks are the symbol of the solidarity of our commitment. And even as the continually changing wind and snow on the surface of the mountains does not alter their basic character, so too the inevitable changes in our life together will not alter our basic love and relationship. To them, what they were saying was not so important as saying it here, in this incredible piece of Canada called Kluani. One of the men who was up there, he said something to me. He said that when he was up there, he was able to catch glimpses of eternity. And that first night, I could see what he meant. We had a full moon that night. It was into a partial eclipse. And it's just a world of absolute whiteness and of silence and of solitude. Kluani. In the high country, stark and beautiful. A dazzling black and white land inhabited only by occasional eagles, ravens, and by a few hardy mountain men and women. Here, no soot falls on the snows of spring, and the loudest sounds to be heard are the cry of the wolf and the howl of the winter wind. Kluani, a national heritage to be kept intact and undisturbed for our children and their children after them. A place near the top of the world for peaceful communion with nature and with the universe itself. A place for all of us.